Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Dairy Team webinar series. Uh, my name is Jennifer Bentley. I'm a dairy field specialist housed in Northeast Iowa. And I'm here today with my colleague, Fred Hall, who's the Northwest Iowa Dairy Field Specialist. So this webinar series is hosted on the third Wednesday of each month and is hosted by our Extension Dairy Team. And so it will be recorded and archived onto our Dairy Team website, as well as our YouTube channel, if you'd like to view it for later viewing. And so today, Fred is going to present some material on steps to control rats and mice on the farm. He'll discuss the ups and ups of rodent control, seal up, clean up, count up, trap up, and bait up as each of these ups are an important aspect of controlling ro rodents. A little background on Fred, he's based out of the Sioux County Extension Office covering the Northwest Iowa portion of the state. And prior to his ISU Extension dairy position, Fred worked for Texas A&M Extension Service as a county agent serving Tarrant, Williamson, and Wichita counties, and prior to his work in Texas, was also the Chickasaw County Extension Director here in Iowa. So lots of extension experience, Fred, and I've, I'm sure you've seen a lot in your career through extension. So uh, pretty timely topic here as we talk about rodent control. So I'll give, give you the floor. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. Appreciate the kind words and welcome folks to uh, today's webinar. Uh, with the change in the temperatures and crops coming out of the field, uh, rodent control becomes a very timely uh, discussion on most of our farms here in the upper Midwest. Uh, if you have rats and mice, uh, you know, the ups or what I talk about, the seal up, clean up, count up, trap up, and bait up. And as we go through, you understand what uh, we're talking about there. The first thing I, I want to discuss is, you know, why are, are rats an issue? And the, the top thing is rats are recognized carriers of at least 45 diseases. Uh, the rats and mice can carry these diseases on their feet. They can be in their urine, in their feces, but they all wind up costing us economically and in production issues. Uh, increase your veterinary costs, can increase your replacement costs, decrease production, uh, and decrease feed efficiency. Second thing uh, that plays a role in controlling the rats and mice is they, they ruin feed, uh, they create a, a cost in, in dollars and cents. A uh, 250 gram rat can eat its weight in feed each day. This means, for example, that a farm with a total population of only 50 rats can easily lose tons of feed every year. A rat produces 25,000 droppings each year, and a mouse produces 17,000. And when you think of the contamination that just those feces can cause, that's a real economic issue. According to the USDA, uh, more than $2 billion of feed is destroyed by rodents each year. Some of the common traits we see on uh, rodents is they have one pair of incisors in each jaw. The incisors grow continuously and because they lack enamel on the back of the tooth, they have to wear down those incisors uh, by gnawing through anything. Uh, basically. Uh, when you look at some of these uh, other traits, they're usually nocturnal. Uh, they're good climbers. They have great sense of smell and hearing, and they're pretty sneaky. They can come through even a very small opening. Uh, the slide there shows uh, something we don't always think about, but a home range. Uh, if there's 
housing and feed and water, rats tendly stay about a, a hundred feet from their nest. They can go farther in search of, you know, food when it's scarce, but as a rule, about a hundred feet and mice about 20 feet. Well, the first thing we, we need to do is, as we consider the, the uh, battling rats and mice is to know what do we have, rats or mice. And as you look at this uh, web uh, page, uh, mice have thin, slightly hairy tails. Rats have thicker, hairless, uh, scaly tail. The nose of the mouse is triangular. Nose of a rat is more blunt and rounded. Uh, colors vary, so that's not necessarily a good uh, way to diagnose. But the droppings uh, for mice are about a quarter of an inch long with pointed ends. Uh, when you physically can see them, uh, the rat has small ears while the mouse has large ears proportionally for their uh, size. Uh, rats have proportionally pretty big feet. So once you've seen both rats and mice feet, you'll tell them pretty, pretty easily apart. Rodents are really breeding machines. When you, you look at how quick they can reproduce, uh, while they only have a one to three year lifespan, they reach puberty pretty early from six to 12 weeks. They uh, have a, a 24 hour heat. Uh, they're pretty promiscuous, so they don't mate for life. They kind of whatever's available, uh, it becomes a daddy. Uh, they breed all year long. So it's not as though they're seasonal and you only have a new crop once a year. Uh, they breed, can be as often as 35 to 40 days. Now look two thirds of the way down on this list for litter size from one to 22. And that, that's an amazing number. You know, if, if you have six litters during the year and they average 20, uh, you have got a lot of rodents there. Um, to kind of go back and talk about the habits, they're mostly nocturnal. And one of the uniquenesses is, is that they cannot vomit. And as we look at some of the chemistry we use for control, uh, that is a real uh, important component of uh, how we can control them with chemistry. Uh, they eat about anything, including themselves. So they're not terribly particular about what they're consuming. And they're neophobic, which means they are real cautious of new things. So if we're going to set traps or baits, we got to give them a, a time period to get used to what has changed in their environment. To kind of go back to, to how fast they can multiply, uh, you assume you have one pregnant a mouse on January 1, and you follow it through the season. By December, you could have 4,500 mice at the location. Uh, to me, that's incredible. That means we have to do control on a regular basis. Uh, and once we spot one, it's imperative that we move into to action. When you are trying to determine, do I really have a problem or not? Uh, you know, visual appraisal is probably the one we most often use. Uh, you know, if if you see just the occasional, you know, once, twice a year, you still have some mice, obviously. If you see them occasionally, you know, once a month you see a, a mouse, you could have 20 to 200 uh, in the population. If you see them almost daily, 
uh, you definitely have several hundred, maybe 300 of them. And visual appraisal is probably not what we actually look for. Uh, the presence of fresh feces, you start seeing one runway warns and burrows. These are all indicative of rodent population and activity. Uh, so you can uh, maybe play into that. If you want to put some track plates down, which are just flat pieces of wood that have like a dust on, and when the mice the rats go through, that they pick up that dust and leave a track. You know, that's a pretty uh, easy way to see. Uh, chew cards, you know, grease sticks, uh, apple slice indexes, all of those things are a way you can see is there rodent activity. You know, whenever we talk about pest control, we always talk about integrated pest management. And it's the same for rodent control. You know, we want to do inspections, sanitation, do the exclusion, rodent proofing, you know, facilities. And once you've got that done, then you have to concentrate on population reduction. And we'll talk about trapping, baiting, uh, predation, and cultural practices. You know, one rat or mouse or evidence of a rodent's present uh, justifies setting up traps and improving sanitation and, and rodent proofing buildings. Um, when you pull out a drawer in the feed room and you see droppings, you have mice, when you see tracks, when you see gnawing damage, because rodents have to gnaw on things to keep their teeth trimmed. It's important if you see that, that you know there's rats or mice there. The other things you can look for is runways. Uh, you know, obviously, they're going to be traveling close to a wall that gives them security. Grease marks on on corners, that, that comes from rats. They have a real greasy hide and hair, and there's look like uh, dark oil stains, and they're from the rats rubbing against surfaces along their travel ways or entry points. Um, they're most likely to be found along linear pathways where they are going from nest to food or nest to water. Um, we mentioned uh, also urine stains. Uh, you can see those. If you've got a stack of old feed sacks and you pick them up and look, you can see those small, obviously fluid stains there. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, rats and mice. They, they travel different distances. Uh, if they're coming in from the field, you know, it looks like they've traveled a long way, but they may have been living 10 rows in all summer. And now they're moving to feed and water and harborage for uh, protection. You know, the other thing you can, you know, it's easy to notice live or dead rodents. You know, when the house cat goes out and brings you back a prize, a dead mouse, uh, they found it someplace, and that's a pretty good indication. Uh, hearing rodents, you know, in the house, it, real easy. You're, you're in bed at night, and you can hear that scratching sound. Uh, in the ceiling. But if you're in the feed room and uh, out in the barn and it's between milkings, the pump's not running, you can generally hear if there's mice moving around either through empty sacks of feed or full sacks. The other thing I think anybody who's been on a, a farm where there are rats or mice, you can smell that urine and, and feces. That rodent odor is pretty evident. 
once you've identified that you you do have rats and mice sanitation is the very first step before you set a trap or a bait or uh, do anything else you've got to remove where they're living uh, the, the trash uh, is always the first one around empty feed sacks but one of the other things is trimming ground cover that's the pathways that they are most protected around if they're moving from the, the freestall barn to the the uh, silage and tmr area they're moving along the the feed bunk where there's a lot of spilled tmr uh, we need to get that cleaned up. Uh, we need to avoid landscaping that creates habitat. As much as I'm a big fan of mulch uh, when we're putting in landscaping around the, the milk house, don't use mulch. Uh, use the river rock or, or things that do not allow good harborage. Uh, don't blow grass clippings or leaf litter against buildings. That's another way they can go under that and, and move around. Uh, exterior trash cans and dumpsters need to be fitted with solid lids. Uh, obviously, that's a food source, but if they can't get into it, that prevents that from, from being a, a problem. The other thing we often don't think about is, you know, if we have a small plumbing leak, it's not causing us great problems but what it is doing is creating enough moisture that rats and mice can be getting their water there if we've got a, a cow tank that blows over it's set too high and is always wet around there set that float lower you know clean up that uh, mess so that that moisture isn't what the, the rats and mice are are using to survive And then once we've cleaned things up and we've identified uh, where they're coming into the, the milk house or the feed room, there's some things we have to keep in mind. Uh, we need to seal all the cracks and holes. It's amazing that a, a mouse can enter through a, a quarter inch hole and a rat through a, a half inch hole. So once we're you know, identified that uh, steel wool, the coarse steel wool, uh, hardware cloth, mortar, all of those things are, are good to form exclusions. Uh, if you have a door, it's been there forever and it's been gnawed at the bottom, we need to put some kind of solid uh, sheet metal plate there at the bottom of the door so that they can't get through it and we really need to make sure that comes up at least 12 inches because uh, both rats and mice can climb pretty easily uh, when you have a whole crack or a gap you know stuff it up get the wire or uh, steel wool get it in there once it's sealed the hole then put something over the top of it and don't forget to check it you know uh, every few weeks because once they've identified a place where they can get in uh, if you have a corner that wasn't completely covered or the steel wool didn't get clear into the corner that becomes an avenue for them to to come in on then we move into population reduction. Uh, we can talk uh, snap traps, multiple catch traps, and glue boards. Uh, we've got to remember when we're using traps that need to be baited, both rats and mice have preferred foods. If you are finding them in your calf uh, kitchen and they're really making a mess of your uh, milk powder that's a preferred food uh, if you've got rats uh, uh, remember that 
they are they'll eat anything so uh, meat is not a bad trap for attracting for them uh, other baits chocolate dry oatmeal trail mix all things that can be used in snap traps we all think peanut butter is the the best but quite frankly uh, research says that it's not the best attractant we have yeah it can be one of those you use but it certainly shouldn't be your primary one um, if you are baiting or setting a trap uh, say on the south side of your barn and you've got a 400 foot run and you've got eight traps you need to vary it up you know put different food choices for them the other thing that I, I always recommend is that some of our baits need to be cotton balls or balls of string and think about it that these pregnant females who can be pregnant six eight nine times a, a year they'll scavenge for these items to make a nest so a cotton ball as crazy as it sounds pregnant female thinks that's a real prize and hopefully that ends that particular litter uh, then we want to remember that rats are afraid of new objects so you want to start by setting your traps unbaited where you're going to, to use them and get them used to, to going over the top of it or going into it and uh, then set those traps uh, with the, the bait. Multiple catch rodent traps, uh, what you frequently see from the professional rodent control folks. That way they can set that trap and come back next week and they may have two, three, four uh, rats or mice uh, in that trap. Uh, for individuals, you know, if you're walking by uh, a snap trap, that's certainly, you'll see that every day. <clears throat> One of the things that we don't always think about in the placement of traps is if we're using a snap trap, how do we set it? Well, we need to set it against a, a wall because that is a travel way that uh, both rats and mice are going to use. They're not going to go through the center of the, the building. They're going to go along the edge. And we want to set that snap trap with the trigger next to the wall. And if we really want to increase the odds, put two of them together because they may get by the second, first one, but they certainly won't get by the second one. And we can either do that parallel or perpendicularly so that if it's against a wall, it's in their travel area. Uh, do not set the trigger away from the wall or set the triggers together. Uh, and then uh, don't set those traps too far away. If they're an inch away from the wall, that gives a travel way the mouse walks right by it. Now we'll move into the poison baiting and fumigants. And, and I rarely talk much about fumigants because if you are a grain producer, it probably is useful in the grain storage area. But in the barn, it's probably not the, the choice that you will be using. Uh, we divide it a couple of different ways. We have single dose poison where the bait is consumed and it's enough that the rat or mouse dies. Multiple dose poisons have to have multiple feedings by uh, the rats and mice because the cumulative effects lead to the death of the animal. And warfarin was probably the original uh, chemistry that we think about when we're, we're looking at that. Um, we also, you know, divided as far as anticoagulants and non-coagulants. Uh, 
poisons that can be administered in bait blocks, liquid baits, pelletized or, or treated grain. And the anticoagulants interrupt the ability of the blood to clot. Uh, first generation rodenticides require rodents to feed multiple times to receive the lethal dose. Second generations can kill the rodent after a single feeding. Uh, on the second generation rodenticides, uh, they can succumb in a, a day or two. You know, it's not as though it takes a, a lot of uh, feedings. Uh, the big thing is you've got to prevent bait shyness. Um, rodenticides are classified as general use pesticides or as restricted use pesticides. Most people in agriculture understand that uh, there's a difference. You have to have a, a license to use a restricted use. But in actuality, many of the general use pesticides have the same active ingredients as the uh, RUPs. They just don't have the quantity in the packet that moves it into the restricted use area. There's some ways we can make sure that uh, bait stations and these poisons uh, have enhanced efficiency uh, and we'll just go down that list. You need to protect the bait from moisture and dust. Uh, if it's diluted with uh, rain that can move it away, it not only maybe doesn't have enough for the chemistry to kill, but it may move down and expose that chemistry to other animals. Uh, you need to have a protected place for the rodents to feed. They want to feel secure. So if you've got a bait box where they can come in and be out of sight of predators, that's what they need to, to do. The bait box also keeps non-targeted species, uh, including pets and wildlife and children, away from toxic, toxic baits. Uh, you can prevent the bait box will prevent accidental spilling of bait and it offers the applicator access to determine what's going on are they feeding and is it time for refilling now we also have some factors that are going to affect baiting programs, uh, the availability of, of other food sources. If you haven't cleaned up and containerized uh, the milk replacer we talked about before, they can still get to it. Well, they don't necessarily need to, to go to that bait station. Uh, if you don't have enough bait placement stations. If you've got a 400 foot barn and you've only got two uh, bait stations, chances are their effectiveness is pretty low. The other thing we have to maintain these bait stations, keep them clean and dry. Uh, you know, just a lot of uh, everyday maintenance. If something dries over it, repair it. Uh, you don't really want to move bait stations around. We all get impatient. You know, we, we think we saw a mouse over here, so we move the bait station. But remember, it takes some time for rats and mice to get used to something different and get used to, to going close to it before they start consuming any of the bait. So uh, have some patience. And finally, uh, maintain them by having fresh bait. When uh, you put some grain that you put poison on and it's gone, it's no longer a, a trap. So uh, keep fresh bait there. The other thing I'm gonna talk about two biological controls. Uh, you know, the, the feral cat or the house cat or barn cat has been everybody's favorite 
animal. Uh, we all have seen the cat bringing a mouse up to the, the back door. But in actuality, mice are, or cats are not very effective in controlling mice and rats. They are excellent vectors for many diseases. So, you know, the, the notion, especially in the swine industry, is no cats in nursery barns. And I would use that same logic, no cats in the, the calf barn or calf nursery. Uh, research says that, you know, while you may see a, a cat with an occasional mouse. It's very rare that you will see them actually eliminate a rat. The other thing we uh, have been seeing a lot of uh, in the last decade is these uh, high frequency uh, repellents. They under, operate under the idea of using high frequency sounds to drive mice away from food sources and nesting grounds. However, not a lot of data that says that actually happens. In fact, uh, the noise may create a, a issue for a short period of time, uh, but animals tend to adapt to it and in a short time they become accustomed and are back to uh, raiding the, the feed bunk or the uh, storage area. Uh, the secondary issue is these devices can be heard by dogs and cats and some other animals so you may find that you know, your dog won't go into an area where you're using one of these high frequency devices. And that may or may not be a problem. It certainly a problem if your dog is part of your, your herding process and he absolutely won't go in to the, the fourth pin. Uh, all of a sudden he's not able to do his job. At this point, I, I'd open it up for any questions. Uh, if we have any questions, Jan. Uh, 